Hey, welcome home, everybody. You're watching Legacy Television. I'm Jeremy Pearsons. We're glad to have you with us. Tuned in on the broadcast today. I'm coming to you again from Legacy Church, Green Mountain Falls, Colorado, which is so cool just to get to say that. I'm standing today in the hospitality room of the church. Now, in the last several weeks, while people are still sort of being socially distant and restricted on our gatherings, we've actually been having some services in here, not open to the public, but with those who've come alongside us and said, this is our church. We want to serve here. We want to give here. So we've actually had many of our service teams, our volunteer teams, come into this room over the last several weeks for some amazing services together, great times in the presence of God, around the Word of God. And it's all in anticipation for the launch of this church. And we're excited about what God's done, the, the great things He's doing, and the greater things that are yet to come. We've made great progress in our buy-up and build-out project. We're here in a 30,000-square-foot facility. Believing God for $100 a square foot, and what we believe that enables us to do is get that sanctuary finished, get the grounds completed, and get the doors open to welcome people from this community, people from Colorado Springs and places around us. But we want you to know that no matter who you are or where you're watching, you're welcome too. You're welcome to pray with us. You're welcome to give with this, but you're welcome to come and join us here at the leadership of the Spirit of God. And if you want to be a part of this project, I've got some information for you right now on your screen, a number of ways you can get involved. But do it and do it in faith. If the Lord leads you to be a part of it, then do it confident that every seed reproduces after its own kind and your seed into this kingdom project opens a door of access for God to go to work in your life. Amen? Amen. Right now I want to take you back into the sanctuary for the continuation of the message that Sarah and I did together called The Righteous Response. So important that you and I know how to respond to what's going on around us in the world right now, but not just respond out of our head, not just respond out of our feelings or emotion, but respond out of our spirit and respond with the word of God. So watch this. This is the righteous response. This is so important for us in this church. He said, let love be without hypocrisy. Now we were talking about this weeks before any of this. We'll get that later. We were talking about this weeks before any of this began showing up in the news. Uh, long before um, any of the things that we've seen over the last several weeks. And yet here we are in the middle of it and the word of God is speaking to us about it. Let your love be without hypocrisy. In other words, it can't just be something coming out of your mouth with your heart somewhere else. It's got to come out of your mouth because it's in your heart and it's got to have the actions to back it up. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Verse 10, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. Again, these words kindly affectionate, he's talking about the same love that family would have for each other. The love that you have for your spouse, for your children, for your mom and dad, for aunts, uncles, cousins. It's a family kind of love. And that's the love he's saying he wants at work in the church because we are family. That's who we are. That's what we are. We are family. Let this kind of be kindly affectionate to one another with this kind of family love in honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints and given to hospitality. We'll come back and talk about this again in a moment, but I want to keep reading here. And again, in light of everything we've seen, Notice what the scripture commands us. This is our response, and it's a different one. This response does not look like what you're seeing in the media. It does not look like what you're seeing in the rest of the world, but it is the assignment of every born again believer to respond according to the word. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. What was, the Lord, what was it the Lord told you about that? If you'll spend... All your time blessing, you'll have no time for cursing. If you'll spend all your time blessing, in other words, if that's the only thing that's ever coming out of your mouth mm -hmm. is blessing and blessing and blessing. It's hard to bless somebody in a harsh tone. <laughs> if you notice, bless you. Doesn't really work, does it? There's a softness about it to bless. And when you're being persecuted, it's the last thing on the mind of the flesh. Mm -hmm. It is the last thing that the soul 
wants to do is to bless. But we have to have a different response. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. And that's part of a family. And I, I sought the Lord about it. And I said, Lord, if there is somebody in our family, be it our family here at Legacy Church or the global family of the body of Christ, if they're hurting over what they're seeing happen in the world, then I want to hurt with them. But you can't just commit to hurt with somebody. That doesn't end up doing them any good. It's a different response. It's the response that brings them back to the word of God. It's, it's a soft word that says, I understand. I hear you. I understand where you're coming from. Come with me to God. Let's look to him and to his word. Let's find out how he would respond to this. Mm -hmm. So we've been focusing our time over the last several weeks looking at verse 13. What the scripture said here about distributing to the needs of the saints and being given to hospitality. And I want to make no bones about this. I'm going to be very clear. What Sarah and I are talking to you about as we talk about these things, this is our church growth strategy right here. This is it. We don't have some other secret marketing plan or strategic plan with this group and these groups and these leaders and those leaders. No, this is our church growth strategy right here. Be nice to people. Be kind. Show them the love of God. Be more than just talk. This is our church growth yeah. plan. Am I right about that? Yeah, I mean, for years as well, the Lord's told us that kindness has drawing power. Yeah. And it's like a magnet to this place. If you think about, um, I, I'm, I guess the thing that comes to my mind is all of our staff tells me stories when they're out around town and they come into contact with people. And those people, I've had people that I don't know come up to me and say, if I didn't even know you guys from TV, if I didn't, had, had never heard your ministry, I would come to your church because I met your staff. And God. why is that? It's because my staff, our people here, are showing the kindness and the love of God to everyone they meet in this community. And if you think about what a healthy church is, what a healthy um, body is, it's a place that is irresistible. It's a place that is so kind, is so loving to an, a community that those people want to know what's going on there. Mm -hmm. They want to know, like, why are you flourishing? Why are, you, why are people being healed there? Why are people growing and coming out of addictions and, and flourishing? Well, it's because of the kindness of God. God has shown us His kindness. We have a great revelation of how much He loves us, and we're able to love every single person in our community. So I believe that kindness has drawing power and it's like a magnet to this place. I, I mean, it, I was thinking about, I went and saw somebody this week, not, she's not born again. And um, she, I would probably say she's pretty spiritual, <laughs> but she's not born again. Um, she drove by our church and she said, Sarah, I drove by your church and it was like there was energy around your sign, or the legacy church sign. Well, she didn't know how to say it because she's not born again. But the truth is, there is something coming out of this place. God is on this place. And what it is, is it's the love of God and the kindness of God that's really in all of us that's drawing people to this place. And that is what is going to be really the foundation of this church. Such a foundation of this church is the loving kindness of the Lord. Um, I think about... Uh, how King Jehoshaphat, how when he went out to fight a war, he sends out all of these people before him, the praisers, and he declares, he says, for the Lord, and uh, for his mercy endures and his loving kindness, literally that's translated, his mercy endures and his loving kindness endures forever and ever and ever. What is that? The, there's so much power in the kindness of God that it's able to win a war for you. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. able, it's able to help you overcome and it's drawing, it'll bring people here. So as a church, you know, we're really, really, I know harping on that, but That's it's the truth, so though. powerful. And it's interesting that you brought that up. You know, 
for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. What they would say that over and over, the, that Hebrew word, that hesed, mercy. It's the exact same word that King David used. We've talked about it for the last several weeks, but in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 9, when he's sitting there on the throne of Israel and he cries out and he says, is there not someone left in the house of Saul that I can show the kindness of God to. Yeah. That word kindness is that same word. Gets translated mercy, gets translated loving kindness. It's the hesed. It's the, it's the covenant kindness of God. And, and I know many people see David as a hero for what he did on the battlefield with Goliath. I, I, I know he's got so many amazing medals that he could wear throughout his life. But I, the more I meditate on it, the more I look at that account right there. And that man becomes my hero. Mm -hmm because of what was coming out of his mouth. And I want that prayer, that same prayer to be coming out of the mouth of everybody here at Legacy Church. Give us somebody to show your kindness to. Mm -hmm. Now, when you go back to that in 2 Samuel, what happened was David said, give me somebody from the house of Saul that I can show him kindness. And he ended up calling one of Saul's who was dead and gone now, but he had this servant uh, named Ziba and David called him in and he said, are you Ziba? And in 2 Samuel chapter 9, we'll put this on the screen for you, but I like Ziba's response. He says, at your service, at your service. And the more I meditated on that, the more I realized that's supposed to be what's coming out of our mouth when we come into this place. Mm -hmm. See, right now we're getting a building ready. There's a renovation and a transformation process that's taking place physically with this building to get ready for you to come into it. But that's not the only thing under construction. You are. I am, and God is getting us ready. We are making room like we talked about. Was it last week in church talking about making room? We are making room for not just God and the things of God. We're making room for people. Yeah. We're making place for people to come in here, and we've got some things to get ready. And what came out of Saul's servant's mouth, at your service, should be coming out of our mouth, at your service. Yeah. I'm at your service, Lord. Then this thought hits me as I get, I'm getting ready for this. For you to be at his service, you know what else you have to be? At the service. <laughs> you cannot be at his service without being at the service. What am I saying to you? Make a commitment to come to church. Priority. Make church not just an add-on to your life. Make the things of God not just extracurricular. Make these things priority. And if you looked at church statistics, you would see that Many people, the ones who are going, they're going maybe a couple of times a month, some one out of four weeks a month, mm -hmm. but we don't have to be that way. Yeah. We can make this a commitment mm -hmm. to be at his service. You got to be at the service. Yeah. So Ziba said to King David, I'm at your service. And David said the same thing to him that he'd been crying out to God. Is there not somebody left to show the kindness of God to? And Ziba said, there is a son. Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth. He's lame in both of his feet. And David said, oh, really? His feet don't work? Is there somebody else? Because I'm not really looking for somebody like that. <laughs> no. David said, I love David's response. Where is he? Where is he? And Ziba said, he is in such and such house. He's in a city called Lodabar. That the name of that city literally means no word, no communication. It was so far away and so in the middle of nowhere. You've heard the expression, word travels fast. Not to Lodabar. The word did not travel there. They were so far away. And Mephibosheth is basically in hiding here. And David says, go get him. Go get him. And this is what the kindness of God is compelling him to do. So he sins and he brings Mephibosheth in. And Mephibosheth falls when he sees David. He falls down at his feet. And he said the same thing Ziba did. David said, are you Mephibosheth? And, and, and he said, I, I'm your servant. I'm your servant. And without taking time to go back and look at the whole thing, I would just want to tell you briefly what the kindness of God did for that, that young boy. David said, he said, I am restoring to you all the land of your grandfather. And he called Ziba in and he said, from this day forward, you and your sons and your servants 
all work for him. And that chapter tells us that Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. I believe that's right. So Mephibosheth goes from living in hiding, living in fear, and in one day, he encounters the kindness of God and it restores to him and supplies him with not only land, but help, servants, people to work the land for him. And David said to Ziba and to his whole family, he said, you were going to work the land for him so that he has food in his house. But as for him, listen to this. He said, he will eat bread at the king's table. Mm -hmm. He will eat bread at my table continually. What did that? The kindness of God. Mm -hmm. And that's what kindness does. Kindness brings restoration into people's lives. Kindness, we've talked about this, if you live with an open heart and an open hand and an open home, kindness will put something that was yours into their hand and be a blessing to them. The blessing of the Lord working through you can actually make somebody rich just because of kindness. Mm -hmm. Kindness elevated him. I love what King David did for this young man. He put value back on his life. And what that value did was just like David reaching down to where Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth was, he elevated him mm -hmm. and gave him a place at the mm -hmm. table. That's what kindness does. Mm -hmm. Does your life matter? You bet it matters. It more than matters. Yeah. It's valuable and it is precious yeah. in his sight. Mm -hmm. And this all sounds good, but if all it is is ever talk, it's hypocrisy. So what do we do? How do we put this into action? And this is what we do. Hebrews chapter six, and this is where we'll wrap it up for today. Hebrews chapter six, in verse nine, it says, Beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation. Though we speak in this manner, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. He calls our ministry, Sarah, to the saints. He calls it our work and he says it's a labor of love. But I love what the scripture tells us here. God won't forget it. Mm -mm. You want to give God something that he will not forget, that he cannot forget. And bear in mind, he thinks differently than we do. He thinks in terms of, and in the scope of eternity. You want to give something God to net that he will never forget about you? Serve. Yeah. Minister to the saints. That's what that word minister is. You look it up, it's the word serve. He's talking here about saints serving saints. Mm -hmm. And it's not just talk, it's action. Mm -hmm. I told you this was the last scripture, but there's one more. This is what the Lord quickened to me. Go to the book of Galatians and we'll wrap it up with this. Galatians chapter 5. He said in verse 13, you brethren have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love yes. serve one another. Yes. So there is love in action, not just in talk, but in action. How do we keep from being hypocrites in our love? We don't just say it, but it's actually in our heart and it is expressed in our actions, kindness is the part of love that you can actually see. Mm -hmm. Through love, serve one another. He said, all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this, you will love your neighbor as yourself. I think it's interesting what it says, through love, serve one another. That's not just what you do to serve, it's the heart that you do Amen. it with. And so you could show up every day and say, yeah, I'll be there, I'll do that. Or you can, you can commit your life to serving God. But unless the heart is there, unless there's love behind the service the, that propels you into that, then it means nothing. It's exactly what 1 Corinthians chapter 13 talks about, is that you could, you could even give your body to be burned, but without love, it profits you nothing. Mm. So it's the love behind the service. It's the faith behind the service that makes it something. That's right.
And he said here, all the law is fulfilled in this one word, love your neighbor as yourself. So that's what needs to be happening right now. And you can tell by just turning on the news for about 30 seconds and it's not happening out there, but it is happening in here. Why? Because the church is supposed to have a different response. Mm -hmm. Love your neighbor as yourself. There was a man that came to Jesus in his ministry and he asked this question and it is the question. He said, how do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, will you tell me how you read the law? Tell me, tell me how you read it. He said, well, um, number one, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Mm -hmm. Number two, love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, you're right. Mm -hmm. He said, you do this and you will live. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That loving, we know that loving God is life, but loving your neighbor mm -hmm. is life. Amen. And here in Galatians 5, we see the connection. How do we love our neighbor as ourselves? By serving. Mm -hmm. But that man, when he heard Jesus say it, the Bible says, in an effort to justify himself, he said, okay, well, who is my neighbor? In other words, who do I have to love? Mm -hmm. Who can I keep from loving? Am I allowed to not love that one? Am I allowed to not love that one? Mm -hmm. But instead of answering it directly, Jesus said there was a certain man who went on a journey from Jerusalem to Jericho. And you know this account, we call it the Good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. And in the Bible says, Jesus said, he fell among thieves and the thieves stripped him and they wounded him. They robbed him. And Jesus said they left him half dead. And then a priest comes along. You know the account. You've been hearing it since children's church. A priest comes along. He sees, but he passes by on the other side. A Levite comes along. He sees, but he passes by on the other side. But then a Samaritan comes. And this is really Jesus dealing with racial issues head on. Mm -hmm. And a Samaritan comes and he sees and the Bible said he was moved with compassion. Mm -hmm. That's the same word used to talk about what rose up in Jesus when he saw the sick, when he saw the crowds. The Bible says he was moved with compassion and he healed the sick. That is such a strong word. I wish we had better words in the English language to talk about how strong that, that is because it's not just sad feelings. It's mm -hmm. not just pity. It is such a strong move on the inside. They literally referred to it as the bowels mm -hmm. of compassion because that's where they believed compassion and mercy was down at the core on the inside of somebody. Mm -hmm. And they were so moved on the inside that it demanded action. It required mm -hmm. action. And what what he did, this is so powerful, what he did was he bandaged that man's wounds by pouring in, Jesus said, the oil mm -hmm. and the wine. Yeah. Now, if this man was beaten and left half for dead and wounded, laying out in the street, a lot like we've seen, he's laying out there in these dirty streets, these open wounds. Why do they pour in oil and pour in wine? to stop the infection. Mm -hmm. The oil soothes the pain. The wine kills the infection. Mm -hmm. And right now what you're seeing, you're seeing a lot of pain and you are seeing this thing spread yeah. like an infection. infection. Mm -hmm. What's going to stop it? Mm -hmm. The oil and the wine. Yeah. Both of them, types of the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit. Yeah. How important is the church? You tell me. So important. Because they're not, getting, they're not getting filled with the Holy Ghost watching the news at night. They're not getting a dose of new wine turning on the media day after day and feeding on it and feeding on it and feeding. You've got to feed on something else. You and I are the ones that are equipped with the oil and the new wine. Yeah. We can stop the pain. Yeah. We can stop the infection if we'll allow our hearts to be moved with compassion. Yeah. Who 
You can tell listening to this message today how critical it is that you and I have a listening ear to the Spirit of God within us. The world needs our response, but it's got to be a different one. It can't look like and sound like all the anger that's around us. Our response has to be a righteous one. How do we, how do we respond according to God and according to His Word? And that is what will capture the hearts of people. And that is the only thing that can inject the love of God into a hostile situation and bring peace. So important that we hear this word right now. And what a special time this is for us and for this ministry. Sarah and I just this month are celebrating 10 years in Pearson's Ministries International. And when we look back on what God has done for the last 10 years, it's astounding where he's brought us one step of faith after another, after another. And this is special because 10 years ago this month, she and I were in the state of Colorado driving the highway going, where's our place, Lord? We know it's here somewhere. And I got to be honest, at that time, we thought it was just around the corner. Little did we know that it was going to be nearly 10 years later, but that's okay. One step of faith after another will take you to the place that God's called you to be in. That's your wealthy place where you prosper spirit, soul, and body. And that's what we are experiencing here. Our family, our team, our staff, and now this church, this local church with a global call. Everybody who's involved so far, we are experiencing the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God. We're prospering in this place in every area of our lives, spirit, soul, and body. And that's why it's so important for you to get the word. That's why it's so important for you to be filled with the spirit of God, because he's in you to lead you to that place. Wherever that place is, find it, get in it, and watch God go to work in your life. Thanks so much for watching today, everybody. We'll see you again next time on Legacy TV. Bye-bye.